Using the Buckingham Pi theorem, determine the dimensionless P parameter or pressure parameters involved in the problem of determining the pressure drop along a straight horizontal circular pipe, like the one that I beautifully drew down here. Assuming the pipe is a smooth pipe, that is, you know, disregard that the roughness of the pipe is one of the things that is going to affect the pressure drop. Uh, the relevant flow parameters are the pressure drop itself, we'll try to determine the density, average velocity, viscosity, pipe length, pipe diameter. One, how many dimensionless pipe groups or dimensionless numbers describe the problem? Two, write the equations for these dimensionless numbers. Three, what are their physical significances? Okay, so this is, you know, all you need to know about pi Buckingham Pi Theorem in one go. So we have this pipe here, this beautifully drawn pipe and it's carrying something, but we know there's a pressure drop as we go from one side of the pipe to the other. But how much it drops is a function of all the things that were mentioned before. So the pressure drop, which is the thing we're interested in, is a function of the density, the velocity, the viscosity, the length of the pipe, the diameter of the pipe. Well, the Buckingham Pi theorem tells us that, the Buckingham Pi theorem tells us that the number of pi groups, number of pi groups, will be equal to the number of independent of variables, I should say, of variables, minus the um, dimensions that we have in a given problem. So the first thing we need to do for the Buckingham Pi theorem is determine the number of independent variables that we have. Independent variables. Independent variables. Okay, in this case, they were given, they were laid out. It's very simple. But when you're doing it for real, you need to be like, try to be as exhaustive as you can. See, everything that can affect your uh, experiment, everything that can affect your parameter that you're looking for, and list them all down. Then the next thing is identifying whether there are, they are indeed independent variables or not. So for instance, if you were to include area here, volume here, and any other thing that is not independent, you would eliminate them afterwards because the area is dependent on the length and the diameter. So it's not independent variable, it's a dependent variable. So you can eliminate it here. Or the other option is like you could have kept it here, but then you have to eliminate the things that are um, related to it. Likewise, the volume that's dependent on these guys here, so it's not an independent variable. So there are five of those independent variables plus the pressure drop, which is you know our dependent variable. So pretty much what this is saying is that the pressure drop is a function of density, velocity, viscosity, length, diameter. Okay, what is the problem with that? Well, there's no problem per se, but if you want to find how your pressure drops in regard in, in respect to these things, you have to run experiments uh, measuring the pressure drop for varying densities, varying the pressure drop for varying velocities, varying the pressure drop for varying viscosities. So you need to like run all of these experiments to be able to find how the, how the pressure drop relates to every single one of the, these variables. Instead of that, what we can do is a dimensionless analysis to find these pi groups and then reduce the number of unknowns that we have. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, there's there's six there's five independent variables plus the the um, the pressure drop. So the number of variables that we have here is five plus one. Okay, so there's six of them. And to know the number of pi groups, I need to take and subtract the dimensions that I have. To do that, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to see the dimensions on each and every one of these fellows here, each of these six guys here. So this is how it looks like. The pressure drop, pressure is given in pascals or any sort of... Um, pressure unit, and we know a pascal is just newton by meters squared, right? We know a newton can be further broken down into, you know, newton's force equals mass times acceleration, so we can break that down into mass times acceleration, meters per second squared, and there we still have the meters squared there, so this is the same thing as kilograms per second squared per meters, okay? So that's like breaking down into the fundamentals. Now, what are the dim dimensions on these units? Well, Kilograms is a unit for mass, so uppercase M. Seconds is a unit for time, time squared. And then meters is a unit for length, okay? You have the option of doing it this way here or doing it this way here. Me, I prefer doing it this way, this, this first way here, because I find that to be more intuitive. But in the lecture, you learn it to do this way, so I'm gonna stick with this one as we're doing it, okay? What's the, there's like, they're literally the same thing. The only problem is that I've seen sometimes students, they get these things confused, right? So we have meters, which is a measurement of length, and you have M for meters and M for mass, and then that sometimes just, you know, just mistake what we're doing there. So stick with one of them and you should be fine. 
right? So let's look at the other things that we have and let's break it down, break them down into their dimensions. Um, by the way, I use TI, generally people just use T for time. I use TI just to remind you that this is not temperature and then temperature, generally people use K for temperature to distinguish uh, t time and temperature as um, dimensions, okay? So let's look at the next one we have. We have a uh, density. Density is kilograms per meters cubed, which in its fundamental dimensions is just mass divided by length to the third, okay? Um, the other thing is that if you're looking at this, it doesn't really matter, right? If, for instance, I've, I'm putting everything in, on the international system, but it, this could be, I don't know, megatons, and this could be miles to the third, right? It could be this whatever weird unit you would want it to be, but it would still be sort of mass, a type of mass divided by a type of length. So this, this is the beauty of the dimensional analysis. It doesn't matter. Next one, uh, velocity. Velocity is meters per second. So if we break down this into its dimensions, we have, this is a measurement of length divided by a measurement of time. And we're gonna do this for every single thing that we have here. We go to the right. Uh, what else we have? We have viscosity, we have length, and we have diameter. So viscosity is measured. You can check on the, the table of your weekly question. You can check on Google. You don't have to know these values by heart. Um, but dynamic viscosity is kilograms per meters per second. So kilograms per meters per second. And if we break down this to, into dimensions, that's going to be mass divided by length divided by time. And then L and D are quite straightforward. L is, you know, meters. So this is length. And then diameter is also meters and also length. Whenever you are starting this, you know, starting to do the Buckingham Pi, and you see that you have two different independent variables that have exactly the same um, dimensions, that's going to be one of your pi groups. Okay, so beforehand, before doing any math, I already know that one of my pi groups is going to be length over diameter or diameter over length. That's going to be one of them. But let's do it. Let's do the whole thing. Let's pretend we don't know that. Let's do the whole thing. So now the method I'm going to use with you guys today is called the step-by-step -step method. And it goes like so. I'm going to list all the variables here. So I have my pressure drop. I have, I want to get this table right. I have my viscosity. I have my density. I have my diameter. I have my diameter. I have my velocity and I have the length of the pipe. Okay, and I'm going to write down what we just found for each of them. So we found out that the pressure drop was, where is it? Is mass divided by time squared length. We found out this guy here is mass per times per length. We found out this guy here is mass per length to the third. We found this guy here to be just length. We found this guy to be length per time. And we found this guy to be length. Okay, and what I'm going to do in each of these steps, so this one step, one step, one step, is I'm going to, going to try to eliminate one of the dimensions. Okay, and I'm going to start, and then you can choose, it doesn't matter, you can choose whichever you want. I'm going to start with length, because we have two things that are already in respect to length, so that's very straightforward. So I'm going to start with eliminating length, right? Trying to eliminate length. So in order for me to eliminate length from the pressure drop, I need to multiply the pressure drop by something that has the length dimension. So I can multiply that by diameter or length, it does not matter. It's a, okay, it doesn't matter, you could choose. So I'm going to do P times the diameter. This is going to leave, leave me with mass divided by time square. Uh, same thing for the viscosity. I need to multiply by something of length, so I'm going to take viscosity, multiply by D, and that's going to get, leave me with mass per time length. Oops, no length, no, no length anymore, per time. Um, if I want to eliminate the density, uh, the length from the density, I need to multiply by d to the third, right? So d cubed, and that's going to leave me only with mass. Once you have something that's only in, you know, only one dimension, then you have reached the, the point in which you don't have to go further on that line anymore. For diameter, it's already one, so that's, you just put a dash there, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, for the velocity, if I want to eliminate length on the velocity, what I need to do is divide by the diameter. And so velocity divided by diameter is going to leave me with one over time. 
And if I want to eliminate the length, the, the dimension from the length, all I need to do is divide the length by the diameter, and that's going to give me 1. Whenever you reach 1, you found a, a pi group. So one of them is going to be length over diameter like I anticipated in the beginning. Um, so let's keep going. What's the next thing we're going to eliminate? We're going to eliminate time now. We're going to eliminate time now. Eliminate time. To be able to eliminate time, I have to... I'm going to use this guy here because this guy is only dependent on time now. So if I want to eliminate time, what I need to do is I need to divide in case here so you can see that obviously. Hopefully you can see that this is... So if I do diameter over this, I just have time, right? Um, so if I multiply by the square of this, this fellow by the square of that, I can eliminate time. So that means that if I do the pressure drop times the diameter times my diameter over velocity squared, I can eliminate my time component on this top uh, top line here, top row here. And this will leave me just with the mass. So likewise, if I want to do the same thing on the second line, what I need to do is multiply, but instead of multiplying by a square, just once, right? Because I only have one time on the bottom there. And that's going to be leave me here with the mass only. Here, I already have just the, the mass, so no dramas there. Just put a dash. A dash, I have a dash. Here, I only have one thing, dash. And this already, I've concluded my, my uh, pi group. I don't have to do anything. So now, I have, I already found one pi group, and you can see I'm going to find the other two pi groups over here. Right? How many pi groups are we going to have? Well, I found that I had three dimensions and I have six variables, so I should expect to find three pi groups. Right? That's what the theory tells us. The number of pi groups, Bergheim pi theorem tells us that the number of pi groups is the number of uh, variables that I have minus the number of dimensions that I have. I already found one in the bottom, length over diameter, and now I'm looking for the other two. The last thing for me to eliminate is the mass. And here you have options. You can divide this by this, or you can divide, because we have the mass here already, we can divide things by the mass. So I'm going to do, I'm going to divide everything by this guy here. So if I take my pressure diameter to the third velocity squared, and I divide the whole thing by density diameter to the third, I should get one, right? So let me just simplify this a bit. Uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. This is the pressure drop divided by the velocity squared times the density. And that gives me 1. And that's going to be one of my pi groups right there. And over here, the same thing. I'm going to do my viscosity. I'm going to divide by... So I have viscosity diameter squared divided by u. And I'm going to divide this by 1 over density diameter to the third. This should give me 1 as well. And here, the simplification becomes density divided by the velocity, sorry, viscosity divided by velocity, density, and diameter. It should also give me one. Cool. So now, theoretically, I found the three pi groups, right? Doing this step-by-step -step method. What I can do now is actually check, see if it makes sense by looking at the units. You know, if it makes sense, it should all be dimensionless, obviously. The, um, let's do it here on the first one. So the first, so my first pi group, first pi group here is Pressure drop divided by velocity squared density. Unit for pressure drop. Let's, this, we're just checking, so let's just put it in, in blue here. That's going to be uh, Pascals divided by meters squared, second squared, divided by kilograms per meters cubed. Again, same thing. I'm going to split a Pascal into newtons per meters and newtons into kilograms per uh, kilograms times meters per second squared. So, kilograms meters per second squared divided by meters squared and everything that we had before. So second squared, meters squared, kilogram, meters cubed. So hopefully, if we did everything right, we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Great, and then second squared. Okay, so great. This is indeed non-dimensional, dimensionless. Our second pi group, this guy here, is the density divided by velocity, sorry, I can't viscosity divided by velocity, density, and diameter. Anybody sees what this is? Does this ring a bell? Yeah, inverse, right? So Reynolds to the minus one. 
Raynus to the minus one. So you know one of the five groups here is Raynus. And note because it's dimensionless, it doesn't matter whether it's you know to the minus one or not. It's going to be the the point of it is the same. Um, so we know that's going to be already dimensionless because we know Raynus is dimensionless, but we might as well check. Uh, if you guys recall viscosity, where's my viscosity? Here it is. Kilograms per meters per second. Kilograms per meters per second. Velocity meters per second. Density kilograms per meters cubed. Diameter meters. Hopefully, kilograms, kilograms, one, two, three, one, two, three, ten seconds. So, good job. We have another dimensionless guy. And the third one, this is the simplest one to check, right? So, we can just have meters over meters, meters over meters. So good, dimensionless. All right? So, this method, the step by step method, gave us the three pi groups that we expected to find, three dimensionless numbers that we expected to find um, for this given problem. Now, last part of the question, what does that mean? What's the significance of this? Well, like I said, first, because this is a pi group that has my pressure drop, which is the dependent variable, then that means that pi group one is actually a function of my pi group two and my pi group three. Okay. Now, note how this is much simpler than this here. Right? Instead of having one thing that I have as a function of these five guys here, now I have a pi group that's a function of another two pi groups. What does that mean? It means that I can probably, if I want to run experiments, for instance, I can do the following. I'm going to vary my pi group two. Okay, so I'll be varying the viscosity, the, the, the relationship between viscosity, velocity, density, and diameter. Okay, so I'm going to do different values for this, and I'll observe how this is affecting my pi group one. Now I'll collect data, and let's say the data is something like this. Okay, and I can see how this, and all, all this for a given pi group three. And I can do the repeat the process again and see how this is varying for a different pi group three. And then I can do the same thing once again for a different pi group three. So now what I... Before I had to do five, six experiments to be able to find how this relationship goes, now I only have to do one or perhaps two. Right? I can see how my pressure drop is changing. For instance, I can do pi group one in respect to pi group three if I want to. That's another possibility. So this simplifies the analysis a lot. And there's actually a very good video I'm going to share with you guys later about um, the Mars Land Rover, in which they they show like how they apply this to be able to, you know decrease the amount of unknowns they had, the amount of variables they had, and the amount of experience they needed to, to run. Um, did I say the number of pi groups is the number of variables? Might... Yes, that's what the Buckingham Pi theory tells us. The number of pi groups that we're going to have for a given situation is the number, so it's the, the dependent variable that we're interested in, plus the independent variable, so the, that creates the number of variables, minus the dimensions that we have. Yes. Okay, that's the, that's the, the power of it. One thing to be aware of, just want to make sure you guys are aware of this. There's no way for you to know. So you know it's a function, okay? You know one thing is a function of these two guys here. You know it's a function. But you don't know what that function is. So I drew it like so, but it could have been linear. It could have been this, okay? It could have been quadratic like this, for instance. So the, the Buckingham Pi theorem doesn't tell you the function itself. It tells you the things that are uh, relevant, okay? To be able to know whether it's going to be like this or if it's going to be like this or the way it's going to be, you need to run the experiments and see where your data fits, and then you can can do a, a fitting, a mathematical fitting to see which type of function you, you would best fit the behavior you were observing. Okay, that's the that's the idea of the Buckingham Pi theorem, and that's how you do the step by step method for it. Do you have any questions on this? Let me stop recording.